Isn't that a great song? You know, God teaches us to be patient, but he also gives us patience because that's a fruit of the Spirit. And I met this man in, way back in Bible college, and I was having a hard time being patient because I had a little list, and God told me at one point, take all that stuff off the list. All you need to do is find someone who yearns for me the way that you do. And then he showed me him. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to Pastor Mark Howley, my husband. Oh, thank you. Thank you to Tanya and Tom and Kevin, and thank you to all of you. What an awesome privilege. And actually a little daunting when you get the um, that moment after you've been asked to, to do this and you realize if, when I open my mouth, people are going to be expecting me to say something that God wants me to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think maybe, the, yeah, you have to have a little humility at that moment. But I do want to thank Hayward Chappelle because back a while back when he taught up here, he sent me on a quest because he told a story about sailing with his family and how he learned after that that dropping the anchor in the midst of the storm would have taken his boat and made it go right into the wind and how that would have settled things down. And what I'm going to want to talk about today is how that hope that we have is an anchor to our soul. Um, but something that's exciting that's going on, um, I would actually like to have John and Sammy Hager come up for a moment. Tell us about an exciting new opportunity that's coming for them. That They have something going on called Skate Ministry. And there's just so many exciting things. We hear so many things about the negative of what's going on in the world. Well, that's because certain entities have an agenda. Our agenda is what God says our agenda is. And he has things going on all over the place. If you'd like to tell us a little bit about this, it'd be great. Yeah, yeah. So I, I really love that song that came on there. I actually went and got the name of it from Casey. That was really cool. Um, but patient. And that's something that we're sort of working on um, at the skate park. So we're going every week to the skate park. Usually we try and get there multiple times a week. And uh, just be patient with these kids and pour into their lives and build relationships with them and just connect with the children and the, and the kids and the guys um, that are at the skate park that are over there being, you know, maybe missed by the mainstream churches, you know, maybe thought of as, you know, ruffians or hooligans and troublemakers. And, uh, and they're really not. We, uh, last Saturday, we were out there and we painted, um, we painted over all the graffiti at the skate park. And most of the guys that came and volunteered were the skaters were the kids who were using the park, right? And so it's not necessarily them who are the, the bad kids out there, right? They're, they're really there um, just to have fun and to enjoy life, and they're really a, a, an awesome community. They, are, they, they redefine family when I, when I see them hanging out with each other because they are so close-knit. And so um, we've just been out there um, feeding them every week and trying to bring them popsicles and Gatorade and stuff, you know, just to... Um, show them that they are loved and that they are cared for. And there was this one time we went out there, it was one of the first times, um, and one of the kids was like, what's going on here? Is this, you guys charging for this? And I'm like, no, 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 we just, we just come out here because we wanted to you know, show some love to the skaters and see some kids doing some cool tricks and uh, get some good exercise ourselves. And they were like, wow, thank you so much. People don't care for us. We, you know, this is, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And it just, it really tugged on my heartstrings um, when, when that guy told us that. And uh, so, yeah, they, we got an awesome crew that's hanging with us, um, making it happen. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, Michael back there is uh, giving us a hand. And, uh, and then also Brandon Ike is uh, coming out and uh, We've seen uh, Owen Carson, Carson's team 
uh, um, a handful of times out there too, skating with us. And so, yeah, we're just we're just going out to the skate park, trying to build some relationships and uh, plant the seed of Jesus and 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 really give love and show love and uh, just help them, you know, see positive influences and positive role models and uh, and really see what it is to be loved and. Um, hopefully we can uh, see some lives changed. It's probably only been like a year or so since we first got the vision for this, and I was like, is there even a skate, mi- is there even a skate community here? We had no idea. What kind of skate community? Uh, skateboarding. <laughs> skateboarding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, a lot of people do. Well, and there's bicyclers, and there's... There's, there's BMXers and, there's scooter, and scooter, scooter kids. kids, but mostly it's skateboarders. And I'm like, I don't know if there is. So we just started driving by, and we couldn't really tell. But it was very evident very quickly. There is a very big skateboard community right there in Troy. The skate park's right off Main Street. A lot of people don't even see it. Um, But there's a bunch of them, a lot of them, middle school kids into their 20s. And really the heart of it is, for me, the heart of it is to give them an opportunity to encounter the love of Christ in a non-religious way. Because these aren't the kids that are going to walk in this Sunday morning we're not out there handing out tracks. We're not trying to scare them off. We're trying to love them and show them the love of Christ in a way that they can receive and then build a relationship from there. So it's been really neat. Thank you. <laughs> so we sewed an offering into them today and um, because they're, did they say they're cooking for them? And did you hear that part? So they're doing, they're, you know, different things that God puts on their heart. I, I wouldn't be surprised if God has them do other special things for them. The, I don't know what the letters are, but it's three. I'll say L is in love, C is in Christ. Would that be? Yeah, live like Christ, love like Christ, love like Christ, lead like Christ. So if you would like to write them a check or hand them an offering, be, they have, it's a 501C. And it would be 3LC. All right. So we wanted you to know what they're doing. Isn't that exciting? I love it. And I love how God has done this with our ministry where there's things that he grows alongside of us. And it's great for me because we don't have to run it. We don't have to say, like, we're all up in that. You just do what God told you to do and we'll help you. So thank you, Mark. That was very gracious. Thank you. Well, I think we've seen a little theme with children and young adults and just fresh, new coming into the church. And we need to see more of that. Um, Part of what I wanna talk about um, will give us a foundation where we can reach out in the midst of whatever the latest crisis is that life wants to throw, okay? For whatever reason or whatever entity or whatever throws this stuff out there, that's what's been going on for, what, 14, 16 months now is, you know, we, we need to tell you how to run your life because there's this crisis going on. Well, there's always a crisis. When this one wanes, something else will come up. We are not supposed to be blown about by all of these winds of the things that are going on around us, okay? We have an anchor of our soul. Um, Casey, if we'll go to um, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, please. And I am, I'm going to drop this one in Hayward's lap because I really hadn't thought about this until he told that story. And oh my gosh, how that impacted me on that day and every day since then. That story of how that one feature that anchor changes everything when you're sailing but that anchor changes everything in our lives when we obtain when we get to the place where we say okay Jesus Christ is mine I'm his he's mine and in Hebrews in 6:18 it says that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, 
and which entereth in into within the veil. And there's a whole context around this, which I will not have anywhere close to the time to, to discuss here with us, but that anchor is what got me started thinking about this subject and how we need that day in and day out. And it gives us something. It gives us strong consolation. It gives us the anchor in the midst of all of the storms that want to come up because we're, that's not our life anymore. Jesus already took all of that, paid it, Okay, my life can be peaceful, should be peaceful. It's something that we've strived for in our home. Our home was to be something different than the world around us. It's, it needed to have that cosseting of this is a place of peace where when we come in from all of the things that are going on around us, we get what we need. We get settled down, fed rested and prepared for what's going on out there because we have something to tell people. We have something to offer and if the storm is pushing us around, we're not gonna speak of it as much. We need that anchor. But I want to jump back to Psalm 139 real quick. Verse one. I wanna look first and foremost at how close are you in God's mind? Because, okay, we, we talk about how we think about him. What about him thinking about us? Okay, and in verse one, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. And I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly there, Brendan. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Let's jump to verse seven. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the earth, or parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me, even the the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. My, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. That's his thoughts about us. Because I read that a lot of times and I, I, when I was in my youth and I thought, oh, yeah, the thoughts of God are precious to me when I'm thinking them. Mm -mm. That may be one understanding of it, but the understanding that speaks louder to me right now is his thoughts toward me how often he's thinking about me. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. And I think the reason I wanted to go there that quickly because the subject we're getting into 
having patience in the midst of the storm, a lot of what the storm is about is to try to distract you from how God's working in you and the plans that he has for you and through you on how to reach out. If he can get us distracted by the things going on around us, then I, I'm all of a sudden paying attention to me, 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 me. Well, he already took care of that. I just read all of that, and there's no place I can go. There's nothing I can do. There, there's, there's no place that I'm not going to have him so close to me right there that I am in relationship with him, and I am filled by him so that I have to give in the worst of situations, in the best of situations, and everything in between. He has filled us, and he's right there, right now, all the time, in whatever we're in. Let's go to Romans 5. Verse 1. I'm going to remember every time I say something to say what verse it is. <laughs> it's awfully hard to find one if you don't have the verse, right? This is, this is us. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Let's hold there just a second, because this is another place where, for a long time in my life, I read it wrongly. Because we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, my hope is in the glory of God, all of his majesty, all of his power, all of his justice, everything that God is, his glory is what I rejoice in hope of. But then when it gets to the tribulation, I used to read without thinking that I rejoice in the midst of tribulation. That's not what it says. It says we glory in tribulations also. The words... Glory and glory, just a few words apart there are different words. The glory of God is doxa. That's all of his majesty. The glory it's talking about when we glory in the midst of tribulation is a longer word that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but it's actually boasting. I can boast that because of who God is, because of what Christ is in me, because of what God has done with all of us. We have the ability to boast in the midst of tribulation. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience works experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's given unto us. That's what we're to be doing in the midst of whatever is going on. However wonderful, however not so great, um, that is it. You know, I, I, <laughs> Jesus is our example. And he faced more than anything that we'll ever face because he, he is where we can go when we need that strength, okay? Did he take down any systems of this world when he was here? Because actually, that's what his disciples thought he was supposed to do, okay? They were continually telling him, when are you going to rise up and fight? When are you going to push back against all of this? Peter, even at his arrest, still thought... If I pull the knife out and whack this guy's ear off, we're going to get into it and we'll make this happen because Jesus is. He is the one. That's not what he was doing. They didn't understand. And it took them until after his resurrection before they started to understand. But he's the example that I follow. 
Now, there may be things that I need to stand up for. There may be times that I need to open my mouth with certain truths, but I better be asking God when those times are and with whom because the primary thing, I loved what you shared about what you're doing with the skaters because we're walking into their world and we are bringing the love of Jesus Christ in every way that we can bring the love of Jesus Christ. That's what we're bringing to people's lives. And I don't want the systems of this world to dictate to me that I should behave in a certain way and there take me off track of what I want to be able to do. You know, Jesus was offered all of the glory of the systems of this world. And he said no because the price was too high. He also knew that the guy offering was a liar. But you know what? He didn't argue with him. When he was offered the glory of all of the kingdoms of this world, he didn't argue about whether he had that to offer or not. He didn't argue about anything except one thing, and that was only God. God only gets my worship, gets my attention, gets my love. That's it. That's the example that I want to follow. And that's why when I hear things like that with the skaters, when I hear us talking about having new babies coming into our lives, there are a lot of wonderful things going on where we're going to have the opportunity. Can you think of anybody that's going to listen longer and harder to you than your kids? Okay? Just, just try to do something that's different than what you've told them and see if they're paying attention. Okay? They are. They are. They will catch you every time. Okay? You can't do as I say, not as I do. You have to, you know, you got to be showing them. Well... That's part, as I was thinking about this, um, we have the opportunity in everything that we go through, from the most mundane to the most exciting, to find out what God's also trying to teach us in that situation. Okay? When I think of all of these little kids being born, when you're the parent of this little kid, your world is going to, of necessity, start to shrink down a little bit because those kids need you and they need your attention 24-7. And sometimes that can get long. Sometimes it makes you tired. Sometimes you can pull your hair out. But in the midst of that, what are you doing? you are figuring out how to lay your life down for somebody else. Your priorities become secondary to what they need. God worked it into life the way he designed it that step by step, I get to figure out how to lay my life down for other people and how to put my priorities second to what he's got set up for me. And in the process of all of this, he's teaching me. Okay, let's take a look at Romans 15, please. Verse four. Something that happened for the two of us and many others when we were in Bible college. Reverend John Shaneheit, who's now over in Indiana, was one of the speakers that came and taught us, and he taught us Old Testament history. And it was amazing, it was exciting. I'm a map person, I like being able to pull back, look at the whole scope of something and see how this and this and this and this all fit together, how this is connected with that. Well, one of the things that I've noticed, I, I checked out John's website and he's got a 29 hour audio, I believe it's an Apple iPod or something that um, he's got where he goes through his Old Testament, he goes through the entire Bible, book by book, and shows you how the one thing fits with the other. And one that I didn't know that, or I probably would have checked that out too, but I, another one that I looked at was Chuck Missler, 
who founded Koinonia House up in Idaho. And he has since passed away, but he was an electrical engineer who had um, first in the military and then in business had gone all the way to being chairman of the board. Okay, he was, he was a big guy as far as that goes. But what really was cool was he took his electrical engineering thinking and he put together, learn the Bible in 24 hours. And you get 24 one-hour segments or pretty close to it. And he goes through and shows you how this book fits with this book fits with this and how this section fits with that. And it's a wholly different thing that's very exciting to look at. And it reminded me of this verse right here. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And that hope and the patience that comes with it is what we're looking at today. Well, Tanya talked about that last week. When she was teaching, she told us, because sometimes we tend to, um, we learn a certain thing and we go too far with it. But the truth is, is that when it came to God having um, fulfilled the law in Jesus Christ, when we went from law to grace, we didn't go backwards. We didn't get less. We actually got much more, okay? There's not one promise in the Old Testament that you cannot claim for your own, okay? If God did it in the Old Testament, he will do that and more now. And so there is nothing going on in this world that hasn't already happened somewhere, somehow. In fact, you can find it in the Old Testament. I love, love, love the stories in the Old Testament. Okay, do you want a child? Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, all, and yes, Hannah. That, was, that one I was saving for last because <sighs> Hannah was one of two wives and the other wife had children, she did not. Um, you can't say that it was because Israel was on track at the time that this happened that she got blessed because Eli was about as far from walking with God as you can get. And yet... She was in the temple praying. I believe it was tabernacle. Temple wasn't built yet. It was a tabernacle. And she was praying, and she was speaking to herself. Her lips were moving, but she was not speaking out loud because she was so heavy of heart because she did not have a child, and she so longed for one, and she was making a deal with God. If you'll give me a child, I will give that child to you as a, basically as a Nazarite. He will be yours for his whole life. And Eli came along and thought she was drunk. <laughs> okay. Not the swiftest guy on the uh, planet right now, but he was the high priest. And so she said, oh, no, 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 no. No, I'm not drunk, as you might think. I'm heavy of heart. And Eli went ahead and blessed her, told her that she would get the blessing she was looking for because the God of Israel would do it for her. And Samuel was the result. Samuel. And she had other children afterwards. God continued to bless her. But what is the longing of your heart? I would suspect that you don't have just one, okay? I would suspect that you have several big ones and that you have many smaller ones. There is not one of them that God doesn't want to work with to bring you up and make you as effective as you can be in his kingdom on this earth at this time, not only to bless your life, but to bless everybody else that's around you. God is a multitasker. Okay, just when you think he's doing something just for one reason, forget it. You, you'll find out. I mean, think about some of the verses you first learned, the verses of Scripture. Because 
when you first learned them, you had this much understanding of those. Okay, the one that I think of um, most often is trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. That was one of the first scriptures that I ever learned. And I've learned it and learned it and learned it and learned it some more and I continue to learn that verse. Just when I think I'm not going by my own understanding, it's, uh, yeah, that's what you're doing. You're walking by your own understanding here. Turn your eyes upon me. And that's what I think we're striving for. It's wonderful that God has all these promises to us and he definitely wants to bless us in every way possible. But he also wants to work with us in the midst of this because your life, he, okay, we just read that in Psalm 139. He knew you when the sperm met the egg. He knew everything about you. He knew everything about your life from one end to the other. God is outside of time. And he has tremendous plans for what he wants to do with you and through you and amongst all of us. This body of Christ that we're part of is absolutely part of what we get to draw strength from. When I come here on Sundays or some other time and I get to be in your presence, I draw strength from the people that I'm around because how God works in you is different than how he works in me. He may have been trying to nudge me with this and then you come along and in one little bit of conversation, three sentences, you can spark something off in my mind that I never would have picked up on myself. And I love that. I love that I get to be part of your lives and I love that I have that to draw on for strength when I need it. Let's look at Hebrews 6, and we're going to go back to verse 13 to start at the moment. Because this was a little bit of the context of that, that anchor that we have. It's for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Next. saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. When he spoke to Abraham that promise, he clued us in to his part of his nature. He not only wants to bless, he wants to multiply. Again, that's why I love that, that we're reaching out to people in so many different ways. God doesn't just want to bless my life. He wants to multiply his church working with all of us. Saying, blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing, more abundant, God willing, more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, that's us, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. You see, the reason it's a sure anchor is not because of my believing. The reason that we have a sure anchor is because of the absolute immutability of God. Nothing can change his favor toward us. I believe in Romans is where it says in Romans 8 that if he was willing to give up his son for us, 
how will he not with him also freely give us all things? That's his very nature, and nothing can change his nature. In fact, he placed his nature in us when we were born again. With Christ in you, you have the nature of the true God. The privilege we get is that we still have the body and soul. We still have freedom of will. I get to choose to love God the way he loves me. I get to choose to walk with him day in and day out, and he would have it no other way. Because I, you could call it many things, but if there wasn't that free will involved, you couldn't call it love. He loved so much that he was willing to put up with giving me free will, which has to be a little bit frustrating for him at times. And yet he was willing to do that. There are many, in fact, too many stories to go over, but I would direct you to the ones that Hebrews chapter 12 or chapter 11 talks about because it's that hall of fame of faith. And every one of those stories has a different way in which you take a look at what happened with that person's life or those people and you see God working in the midst of a situation or in the midst of their whole life, okay? In fact, it says that in the case of the coming Messiah, those all died in believing, not having received the promises yet, and yet they saw them afar off, and they were convinced of them, and they behaved accordingly. And it's part of what we get to do now. Times when we feel like, this has just gone on forever. Why can't this change? Or why can't I have what I'm looking for? We need this anchor of the soul and we need the immutability of God's counsel in our pocket to know that I have the ability to persevere. I have what it takes to do what's necessary so I can see that promise. And... That's what's happening also with the return of Christ, which is part of our hope, okay? I may or may not see that during my lifetime, but I'll guarantee you I am absolutely convinced of it. Everything that I've seen, everything that God has done, the simple fact that at my will, any time, I can speak in tongues, Okay? There's a lot of stuff that goes with that, but the fact is, is that I can't speak that language. I don't know that language, and yet I know it is one. And the moment I choose to do that, he is right there to energize it. That is such a, that fills me with wonder, but also with energy to go back at what I want to do for him. Okay, yeah, I get frustrated sometimes. I grumble. <laughs> but the truth is, is that because of what he has already done for me, I can persevere. And I can see those promises. And in the midst of what happened, I'm going to take you for about three seconds to Joseph because I just love Joseph. Okay, I just do. And what happened for him was he, at 17, he gets dreams that he's going to be the head of his family and that they're all going to bow down to him, which was not particularly what his brothers wanted to hear. And you would think when you get a dream like that, wow, this, this is going to be cool. The next thing that happens is he gets sold into slavery probably not what he was expecting at that moment. He gets sold and sent down and gets purchased by Potiphar. He's in Potiphar's house, and it's one of the things, when you look at that record, I, I, would, I would go back and look at everything from 37 to 50, 
chapter 37 to 50, in because what Joseph had happened for him is something that actually happens for all of us when we face some of these things. God will lay out something for you that he wants to have happen for you, and then something twists and takes it another direction. Well, I'm not here to tell you why that happens, but I can tell you one thing that God does in the midst of it is that he trains you. Because if you look at it, Joseph went from the vision of being a leader to having to start out as the lowliest of servants. And because it says he served and that God prospered him, Potiphar saw that. And he went from being the lowliest servant to being the major domo of his house, the steward of that household, which was a very large household. Okay? And then, just when he thinks things are going great there, then Potiphar's wife takes a look at him and decides she wants him. And he says, are you kidding me? I can't do such a great evil before God. And so she just decided to lie and say that he was the one that came after her. And so he ends up in jail. Okay, setback number two. Again, he served. And he served the jailer that was responsible there so well and prospered so well that the jailer elevated him to being the steward in that prison, which put him in the situation where the two guys that he had to interpret dreams for were right in his service. He was serving those two, the butler and the baker. You know what? Even after he interpreted the dreams and they came out, it says that, oops, the baker, or it was a butler, forgot him. And two years passed from the time that he was forgotten until Pharaoh had his dream. When you look at that, he was 17 when he got his dreams. He was 30 when he was elevated from prison to be interpreting the dreams for Pharaoh. 13 years, two major setbacks. And all of it, look what God did. He trained him because he went from servant to steward, servant to steward. What was he getting ready for? You got it. Second in charge to Pharaoh, which not only took care of what Pharaoh needed, it saved his whole family. And it set them up on the path that God could take a family, turn them into a nation, and bring them out of bondage to the promised land. And Joseph had that vision through all of the things he went through because it says in Hebrews, the one thing that it says in Hebrews about him is that he gave commandment concerning his bones. When he, he knew, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, he wanted to be with them, even if it was just his bones. He believed in that promise. And he trusted and he worked for it. And some things you see in your lifetime and some things you don't. But I'll guarantee you that if you see afar off, even if we don't quite get there all the way in everything that we plan, God has been at work. And you will see the fruit of it one day when Christ comes back. Because you don't know every time you open your mouth how the words are going to affect somebody's life. But I can just about guarantee you that every last one of you has opened your mouth with love in it and with the words of God and changed somebody's life. And there's coming a day when God's going to reveal to you how you change that person's life. Quite possibly that they are there with you because of something that you said. <laughs> so I think it's worth working our minds toward having the kind of tenacity that it takes to endure when something is not going right because there's more going on than what we realize. There's training. There's building. 
okay? And God is building his whole family, his whole house, his temple. Only his temple is not of rock anymore. His temple is all of us collectively. And we get the privilege of working with him building his temple. I'd just like to pray with you. I think that's, that's exactly. Father, thank you, God, so much that before time began, you called us. We were in your thoughts just like every other person that has ever drawn breath. No one is missed. God, thank you that we have the privilege of walking with you, stepping out, speaking the words of life. God, just like the, the virtuous woman, we open our mouths with wisdom and in our tongue is the law of kindness. Oh God, thank you for the privilege of being yours for being able to just take your hand and walk with you and dwell in your peace. To see and understand a little bit of what you've done in your son, Jesus Christ. To walk the way he walked. Thank you for this body. Thank you for all of those on live stream. Thank you for the people that we haven't even met yet that are part of our family or will become part of our family. Thanks for the privilege of being together today and the things that you'll be working in each one of us as we go forth this week. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.